Hello, hello. How is everyone this morning? It has been a crazy morning for me so far. Oh my gosh, I feel like I've put in half a day's work and already. Actually, I probably have. Anyway, I'm really glad to be with you guys today. Looking forward to this topic. Um, Let's see. Hey, we got Mac and we got Kiana. Fantastic. Oh, Kiana, I'm sorry. Feeling ill? That no fun. Health is one of those things that we take so for granted that every single day that we're healthy, we don't even think about it until we're sick. And then we're like, oh, I wish I had that health that I so for took for granted before. Oh, I totally get it. All right. So, you know what? We're going to go ahead and jump into our lecture. It's going to be a fairly, well, compared to last week, it's going to be short. I mean, last week was Herculean, right? Um, this is going to be fairly short compared to last week um, and, you know, full of good discussion, opportunity to earn those points, right? We definitely want to get these points going down below. So with that, let me go ahead and uh, we'll set things up. All right. So what we're talking about today is how the Industrial Revolution just changed everything when it comes to how we do work. Now, once again, I am going to reiterate, this is not a history class. So frankly, we're not really going to talk about the Industrial Revolution that much. We're going to talk about the things that it ushered in and are still affecting us today and are changing today. Um, by the way, a few of you have noticed that in the uh, homework and the discussion and so forth, it references a, a video. I removed that video. And since I did not realize that the discussion referenced the video so directly, I just went ahead and gave you the credit for the discussion. So no discussion this week. <laughs> hey, you're not going to complain about that. I hope. Um, I'll fix it for the next semester. But that what that means is, once again, we're going to talk about the principles that um, the Industrial Revolution brought in and how they're affecting us today. Okay. Oh, and you know what's missing? I'll tell you what was missing. The closed captions. I did not have those turned on. So... Sorry about that. Yes, Kiana, you saw it. You saw that coming. Okay, so let's talk. Let's talk. Industrial Revolution. We're going to actually be referencing a bunch of readings today. So if you're kind of like going through the course in Canvas and wondering where we're talking about what, this is where we are the various readings that we're going to reference. Of course, I always show on the right-hand side of the screen um, where the information is from. But just so you know, these are the readings we're discussing today. Okay, so what we're really getting at today are the effects of industrialization on business philosophy. We've talked about a lot of different business philosophy and so forth through this course, but industrialization just messes with everything in some really, really profound ways. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the factories, all right? Now you're gonna be kind of like, okay, listen, Lon, I, psh, I studied the Industrial Revolution in high school. Um, oh, <laughs> Isaiah on your wife's phone. On your wife's phone, I love it. And let's let's go ahead and just start. We've since we've got folks chiming in and stuff. Um, you you've studied the Industrial Revolution, so you understand that this is when 
the factories started. So let's take two slides and just kind of remind ourselves of what brought about the factories, but then we're going to tie it to today. Okay. Not a history class. So spinning jinnies, these are the things that would make fabric, make cloth and so forth. Spinning jinnies, jinnies could be used in the household of the weaver, but the later, the later, yeah, spinning jinny, uh, spinning machines were so large and cumbrous that they could not be used in a dwelling house and required so much power and rapidity of motion that human strength was scarcely available. Okay, 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 okay. Well, what do we care? All right. Here's what's going on. People are making this crap at home. People are are weaving their own, uh, making their own thread, making their own yarn and so forth. And they're, I mean, we can all do this from home. And for ages and ages and ages, folks would produce out of their home. Okay. And that's just the way things were. But they started to realize that if they built these great big factories, they could get something called economies of scale. Economies of scale is a very, very important business principle, one that drives business today. Okay. Um, economies of scale mean that <clears throat> you can produce your good or service. Let's just talk about producing goods for a moment. Um, you can produce it at a lower and lower cost if you are producing more and more of it. Okay, so let me show you what I mean. Um, so internet, internet, all right, you're using internet, I'm using internet and so forth. Uh, internet involves all kinds of capital investment that these companies put out. They, they put in the fiber, they, they have the servers, they have the satellites. There is a ton of capital investment to set up internet and streaming for folks like that. But once that investment is put in, every single customer that comes on is is making that investment more and more profitable. So let's say it takes a hundred million people, a hundred million dollars to set up this factory. In this case, the internet, or over here, we're talking about spinning Ginny factories, a hundred million dollars. And we sign up one customer. That customer is costing us a hundred million dollars. So now we sign up two customers. Well, now each one of those customers have, has cost us $50 million. But if we sign up 100 million customers, each one cost us a dollar, and they're each paying us $100. Oh my gosh! Just by bringing on more and more customers, we can make our capital investment more profitable. That is economies of scale. And that is what's happening here, is by building these great big factories and so forth, they are able to produce more and more goods at a lower and lower per unit cost, which means we can make more profit. Okay, so continuing on. The new industry required bodies of laborers working regular hours under the control of their employers and in the buildings where the machines were placed and power provided. Okay, now check this out. Makes perfectly good sense, right? I mean, we've got these factories with all these spinning jinnies and there's power from the rivers, the mills, feeding these jinnies. Okay, so new industry required bodies of laborers, employees, working regular hours, morning to evening, under the control of their employers, supervisors watching them, and so on and so forth, and in the actual buildings where all this infrastructure is set up. 
Well, you're like, Lon, that's how we do things today. Yeah, but it's changing. So here's my first question to you. And my voice is cracking because I'm so excited. Here's my first question. Where are we seeing this play out today? How have the conditions changed, causing us to rethink this paradigm? So we're talking about a paradigm, a system set up back in the Industrial Revolution that has been with us forever, but today is being challenged and changed in very, very significant ways. And we are going through a new revolution this way. Where do you see this and why? Let's play with this one for a couple of minutes. Okay, let's come back and talk about this. By the way, Anna, what lecture uh, module are we doing? Let me let me make sure I say the right number because it always changes depending on summer and so forth. So the module we are in, and somebody else can chime in, but let me make sure I say the right number. Um, we are in, is it, yes, we are in module six. We are in module six. Okay. All right. Let's, let's play with this. Yes, Kiana, thank you. Module six. All right. We've got some great comments here. We're going to start building up some, uh, some points. So first of all, Isaiah says this reminds him of, you know, cutting the ends off the roast, even though we don't know why we're cutting the ends off the roast and the conditions by which we've cut the ends off the roast or required that changed. Absolutely. We're going to explore how this happened here in this discussion. So absolutely correct. That's what I want you to see. Um, let's see here. So Owen says uh, that I think AI has definitely changed our typical systems, putting potential jobs in people we have done, you know, decades and giving them to AI or people who um <laughs> who are using AI are able to do their jobs better and basically putting people who don't use AI out of work. That's what's going to happen. Use AI. Um, let's see here. 
Um, let's see. Sweatshops being criminal. Oh, sweatshops are being criminalized or thinking about the systems in place. Yes. Excellent. And so forth. Uh, for the safety of the people. Yes, very much so. Okay. Here is my take. Here is my take. Um, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to stand up just because I get, I, I'm going to use a lot of body language and so forth. Okay. So, um, uh, robots in factories over taking over jobs. Yes. Yes. Okay. So check this out before we would be craftsmen at home making our stuff. Everybody's at home making stuff. Yay. I'm making stuff. And then we take it to the market and we sell our stuff. Okay. And, but then the industrial revolution comes along and says, hey, we want these economies of scale. We want to build great big factories and bring everybody together at the same time to work in these factories where we have power and resources and all set up and supervisors looking, you know, watching them and so forth. Okay. Now, I want you to think about white collar jobs here for a moment. Before the pandemic, this is the way it was even in white collar jobs. So I would work for Intel Corporation and I would leave my home and go to the building where I at regular hours and I would have supervisors watching me working on regular hours. And I had not power there. I had power at home, but I had resources. I had a really awesome internet connection. I had all the resources and so on and so forth. So it was the same thing. Same thing as these factories. However, the pandemic has changed this. So during the pandemic, we could not go to these buildings, right? And so everybody's working from home. But check this out. We have many of the resources at home that we used to not be able to get except for at the workplace. So right now I'm teaching a class. Yeah, I got a freaking studio here, right? I have the resources at home. I have the internet connection at home. I have the gear at home, okay? So I don't necessarily need to be in my office on campus. Students can connect with me over Zoom. I've met with many of you over Zoom and so forth. We can talk here and so on. We don't necessarily need to be co-located on site. Many companies are going through this right now. Now, here's the thing, though. Um, there's a lot of companies having, they're struggling with how to adapt to this new world order. So, First of all, especially the younger, you know, employees and so forth don't want to return to the workplace. A lot of the tech workers where I, you know, all my friends and so forth, they all work tech because that's what I grew up in. They don't want to go back to the workplace for the most part. They want to keep working at home. On the other hand, the companies want people to come back because they love that direct supervision stuff. And yet, in order to keep these employees, they have to allow for at least some sort of hybrid solution. All right. Um, Kiana says, uh, I enjoyed the changes the pandemic has made considering school and work from home. Absolutely. That's one of the big things that I pushed hard um, at Salt Lake Community College when this was all going on. I was like, listen, folks, as horrible and awful and tragic as the pandemic was, it forced us to create a bunch of new competencies that make our products and services better for students today. And we need to develop these new competencies. So this whole thing that came about during the Industrial Revolution and has been with us up until March of 2020 is now once again being challenged. A lot of folks are saying, I don't see why I need to return to the workplace. And those economies of scale are not lost. And so it's it's fascinating to think, whoop, let's bring you back up, that we are in the midst of another revolution. 
Now, add to that AI, just as you guys pointed out, and add to that, um, you know, everything else going on, and you will, you will be working in a completely different environment once you are growing a career in the workplace. So, uh, yeah, this isn't a history class. And, and, and just as you pointed out, Isaiah, um, you know, why did we bring people together? Because we needed those resources. That's no longer the case. Why did we bring people together? Because they needed to be supervised. Do they, though? They're actually more productive at home. The studies have shown this. It's really interesting how it's forcing us to reassess some assumptions about cutting the end off the roast. Um, gen, um, let's see, I say a, a virtual, um, virtual mental health has changed the game. Yes, yes, virtual mental health has changed the game. You can now see a healthcare provider, um, e either physical or mental, especially uh, if you're dealing with stress, depression, anxiety, so on and so forth. You can do this virtually now. It's it's incredible. OK, so, um, yeah, forever going on. All right. Let's keep going. Now, we are going to start shifting into a concept called laissez faire. We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about laissez faire. Don't worry, we will define it in detail. Um, but it is one of the core principles of capitalism that we are starting to bring into the picture. We've talked about the profit motive. We've talked about free markets. Um, we've talked about private capital, investing private capital, right? Remember the Protestant work ethic. Now we are talking about laissez-faire. Later, we will talk about the invisible hand. Laissez-faire is another core component of capitalism that starts to come into play here. So what is this? Okay, let's, let's play. Thus, the structure of regulation, regulation of industry, which has been built up, um, upon the 16th and 17th centuries, or which had survived the Middle Ages, was now torn down. In other words, all the societal structures that were in place that regulated commerce and so forth were all built around these little cottages and homes and so forth. But now business is calling the shots. The use of powers of government to make men carry on their economic life in a certain way, to buy and sell, labor and hire, manufacture and cultivate, export and import, only in such ways as were thought best for the nation, seem to be entirely abandoned. Okay, this is what brings us to laissez-faire. So let's discuss what laissez-faire is. Laissez-faire is French, ça français. Um, it means leave be, just leave it alone, leave be, hands off, if you will. So according to this um, theory, economic adjustments follow a certain, follow certain natural laws which can be depended upon to work to the ultimate advantage of humanity. And these laws should be allowed to function without interference. Now, this is a quote from Democracy, Science, and Industrialism, okay? But this is a critical thinking class. We need to challenge this. Now, I'm not saying I'm pro or con laissez-faire. We actually are going to support it and detract it on both sides. But let's check this out. First of all, it says, according to this theory, economic adjustments follow certain natural laws. Now, when you say natural, think about it for a moment. Natural laws. Well, first, laws mean it's some sort of controlling factor, a regulation, a, a system that is followed. A natural law means it's just naturally occurring. You don't need to create it. You don't need to conceive of it. It's just naturally occurring. Furthermore, 
When we say that something is natural, that tends to connote the idea that it is good and wholesome and healthful for us. It's natural after all. Well, just so you know, the bubonic plague and syphilis, it's natural as well, okay? There's nothing good or bad about nature. It's amoral. We're going to talk more about this. But when we say that something is a natural law, it kind of gives it this wholesome feel, right? So a natural law which can be depended upon to work to the ultimate advantage of humanity. Well, that's quite a statement, right? That a natural law can be depended to work to the ultimate advantage of humanity. I mean, meteors are part of the natural system and they didn't do too well, didn't do well for the dinosaurs, right? I mean, why do we make the assumption that a natural law would work to the ultimate advantage of humanity? That's quite a step, right? Um, uh, the majority of society accepts it as right, yes, especially when we claim it's natural, right? Absolutely. And that brings us to that one. And then we have, um, yeah, like, like murder, right? <laughs> majority. That Exactly, Anna. Exactly. And then it says, these laws should be allowed to function without interference. Okay. So now, this is what laissez-faire is asserting. Laissez-faire says, leave economics alone. Don't mess with it. Economics are a naturally occurring phenomena that if we leave them alone and don't mess with them, will work to the ultimate advantage of humanity. That's quite a statement, okay? Um, and so those that whenever um, folks talk about regulation are bad, government interference, regulation stifling innovation and government growth and job creation, these are assertions that are rooted in the concept of laissez-faire. Leave it alone. Government is not here to solve the problem. It is the problem. Get government out of the business of business, okay? This is, is laissez-faire. Um, now, the idea here is that on one extreme, we have authoritarian governments that control every single aspect of your life, on the other extreme, we have laissez-faire, which is like there's no government or no government regulation, no controls and so forth. Just let competition and the free market do what it does. Democracy is somewhere in the middle. Okay, we're going to talk about that in future lectures, but democracy is not authoritarian. It's also not pure laissez-faire, right? There are controls in place. All right. Now, to give you an example, and I'll just kind of come over here and show you that, you know, this, I can't show this video in the stream, but there's a really interesting video um, online talking about how wolves change the rivers in Yellowstone. Okay, here's the idea. Um, wolves ages ago were basically eradicated from the Yellowstone region because wolves ate cattle and the ranchers were like, these wolves are causing way too much trouble. We need to get rid of the wolves. All right. Which is regulation. Ranchers wanting to regulate the population of the wolves, regulate them out of existence because they were, you know, getting in the way of their, of their ability to earn a living. Okay, so a few years back, the decision was made to reintroduce the wolf to Yellowstone. And what was extraordinary is that this 
changed the ecosystem entirely in the region and for the better. Okay, so um, wolves ate um, uh, the 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 sick wildebeest and the deer and so forth, and so that diminished those herds. But they were healthier herds. Furthermore, the herds stayed away from the valleys where the wolves did most of the hunting, so they stayed up in the mountains just a little bit more. This allowed the grasses and trees to grow in the valleys, whereas before they were eaten by an unchecked you know, herd of, of antelope or elk or what have you. And as a result, um, you know, this changed the way that the rivers flowed and so forth. This created more habitat for for birds and the like and other smaller rodents, which in turn created more food. So in other words, reintroducing the wolf, so allowing nature to do what it will, um, made the region and the park and the ecosystem healthier. So this is offered up as an example of where laissez-faire is good. Just let nature do what it's going to do because it's natural. And we all know that natural is good and just leave it be. Well, and, and I want to be clear, in many, many cases, I'm actually pretty laissez-faire. I don't want the government in my business. I don't want anybody in my business. So I tend to lean toward laissez-faire. However, <laughs> by no means am I, Kiana, yeah, by no means am I drinking that Kool-Aid completely. You know, here's something that I want to remind us that uh, Ed Ng said in an earlier reading. I really think this is a good thing to remember. Physics and math are sciences, but business and engineering are applications of science. They use the laws discovered elsewhere for their own reasons. And here's the kicker. Sometimes there is a danger in using an application without remembering the source. Without keeping the source of an idea in one's mind, it's easy to make false associations. Okay. I believe that laissez-faire in nature, let nature do what it's going to do, is a healthy thing for the ecosystem. Mother nature doesn't need our help in figuring out how to keep the planet healthy. It needs our health in making sure that we don't screw it up, but its natural state is pretty healthy. However, um, uh, yeah, am I cutting out for everyone? It doesn't look like I'm cutting out for Kiana. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure, Anna. Let's see. My numbers over here say it's working pretty well. My, my data is looking green here. So, everyone, let me know if I'm cutting out in and out for you. Um, back to this, though. If we say, well, laissez-faire is healthy for the environment, laissez-faire must therefore be healthy for economics, because economics is a naturally occurring system with its own laws that will guarantee, you know, the ultimate advantage for all humanity. I don't necessarily buy that. One thing that laissez-faire tends to fail to recognize um, oh, good, 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 good. Glad that it's working now. Ten, laissez-faire and nature is amoral, okay? Let me explain. Nature is amoral, meaning how nature behaves is neither moral, good, or immoral, bad. Nature just follows its own rules, and there is no morality assigned to it. So let me show you what I mean, okay? We love nature. Oh my gosh, we love nature. And by the way, for those of you playing at home, I love nature. I really do, okay? But you see these memes and so forth, you know? If having a soul 
means being able to love and and loyalty and gratitude, then animals are better off than humans. Um, Okay. Or this idea, some animals are better than humans. In 2005, three lions rescued an Ethiopian girl who was kidnapped by men wanting to force her into marriage and so on and so forth. No, they didn't. No, no. (laughs) I got news for you. Lions do not understand the concept of an arranged marriage and forcing somebody into said arranged marriage. If the lions were chasing anybody, it was for food. Okay? These are things that get told all the time. But now, let me show you something. How much different animals murder their own kind. Now, if you notice, 2% of humans are kill or have been killed by their own kind, okay? Uh, No, it's percent of deaths inflicted by members of the same species. So in humans, um, we've we've affected, we've we've killed off 2% of our own species. But now check this out. That's teeny tiny compared to what animals do. I mean, meerkats are murderous things. 19.36% of meerkats have been murdered by other meerkats. Sea lions? Lions. Oh my gosh. Lions murder each other all the freaking time. So the point of all this is, and oh, by the way, over here, okay, it's over there. Okay. You see that? You see the bird there? That's a reed warbler feeding a baby cuckoo bird. Here's how the cuckoo bird reproduces. A mama cuckoo bird who, who has an egg in her, she will find the nest of a reed warbler and she will lay her egg in the nest with the other reed warbler eggs, right? The cuckoo chick will hatch first, and the cuckoo chick is big, even at birth, okay, at hatching. And that chick will push the other eggs, the eggs of the reed warbler, out of the nest, okay, murdering the chicks. And the reed warbler doesn't know what's going on. And so the reed warbler is raising the chick of the cuckoo. Now, this is laissez-faire. Just let nature do what it does because nature is beautiful and gorgeous. And if we acted more like nature, then humanity would be so much better. No, no, that's not the case. We, as a species, benefit from morals, laws, rules, regulations, social constructs, um, expectations of behavior, and, 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 and enforcing these norms among society so that we can benefit. All of these things are, to some degree or another, regulation. Okay? That's my assertion. By the way, just so you know, you don't need to agree with squat. (laughs) You can disagree all you want, and you would be well-founded. I'm just simply asserting that laissez-faire has its place, and laws, rules, and regulations have their place. And we need to look at these things critically to figure out where is regulation going too far, because regulation can go too far, and where is regulation not going far enough, okay? That's my assertion. But the beautiful thing about this class is that you can't be wrong. You can disagree with my assertion, and it's totally supportable. Okay. So, All of this sort of starts to come into play because um, the theory of evolution is coming in. And the theory of evolution is saying, well, now, hold on. If everything evolves naturally to its perfect state, 
then we should allow businesses and, and economies to evolve unhindered, right? If evolution was able to bring up this amazing variance of life and, and just thrive without regulation, well, we should allow the same. So from the reading, by removing man from his smug post at the center of the universe, it gave him a sounder view of the physical universe and a better sense of proportion. Meaning we're just organisms like everything else. And we should just do whatever is best for our survival. That's what evolution does. That's what businesses should do. Okay. And the method of scientific investigation uh, stiffened his system of thought. Skepticism, as Huxley pointed out, was no longer a sin, but a virtue. Okay. So what he's saying there now is in the past, when religion ruled and when mankind was at the center of the universe and God was telling us how to do things and so forth, skepticism didn't really have a place. Challenging the norms didn't really have a place. Um, it was not encouraged. Scientific method was not encouraged or the findings that was brought about due to the method. Um, but now, Theory of evolution says we should examine everything that we're doing. We should be skeptical and critical of every sort of doctrine and dogma that we're following and find better ways to do this. So business is starting to improve because more thought is given to it. And knowledge based on human authority was replaced by that rooted strongly in careful investigation, observation, and logical induction. Okay. Um, so by seeing the world and by asking thought about it, man increases his intellectual independence and mental stature. All right. Ultimately, this is saying that the laissez-faire view of government was all, and to all appearances, becoming entirely dominant. Meaning, at this stage, government was out of the picture now. It was all business and just let it do what it's going to do. Now, mind you, let it do what it's going to do involved sweatshops and child labor and unsafe working conditions and extortion and bribery. But hey, laissez-faire, okay? This changes in the future, as we're going to see. Okay. Um, let's see if I, you know, let's, let's go ahead and do our, 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 a quick little break right here. Hey, we got a new break. Because my butt is tired, we will do our juggling break, but I am going, I am instituting a dance break. I need to get up. I need to move. I'm old, people. This, this body's been sitting in this stool now for two hours doing other stuff as well. Need to get up and move. So no one's there with you, I don't think. No one's watching. So... Allow yourself to get up and dance a little, and I'll join you.
right. Oh, that's better. Tell you what. Got to get up and move once in a while. <laughs> you have kids. Well, they can watch you dance, right? They can do that. <laughs> Nostalgic. You know what? I put in a bunch of my favorite ones, right? I, I, there's actually a few that I, I wanted to add I need to do later. Um, and I, I, I'm always curious how many of the references uh, people, people know. I figure there's one there that most people wouldn't get, but that's all right. Hey, well, if your wife likes it, get out and dance with her, right? Okay. Um, hey, let's see. I'm in the... Let's, uh, let's come back over here. We'll come back over here. Yes. All right. Um, <laughs> best homework. That's right. Got to do that. Okay. Let's, let's talk more about our, our, what's going on with laissez-faire here. So now, hey, let's bring that back up. Um, so here's what's happening. So this has an effect, right? Bringing people together in these factories, allowing the factories to operate in any way they want because we're in a laissez-faire environment. So there's no government, there's no OSHA, you know, you know, health codes, there's no health regulations, safety regulations, there's no worker, there's none of that. So we're shoving people in these factories and we're working them out. So what happens? Well, check this out. Even among those who were supposed to have reaped the advantages of the changes of the times, many unpleasant phenomena appeared, okay? For example, the farm laborers were not worse, perhaps were better off on average in the matter of wages than those of previous generation. So now pause, right? This is essentially saying, all right, Remember, people moved away from the farms and into the cities where the factories were. This is still happening today. Still happening today. So people are moving off of the farms and into the factories. They're getting paid more. That's why people leave the farm to go to the factory. You get paid more. This is why people leave the, their small towns that they grew up in and move to the big cities. You get paid more. Well, gosh, isn't it cool to be paid more? Uh, sure. But hold on. But they were more completely separated from the land than they had ever been before, more completely deprived of those wholesome influences it came from, which came from the use or even a small portion of land, and of the incitement to thrift that comes from the possibility of rising. Okay, I want to break this down. I want to break this down. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, you changed more too. Yes. Let's play with this for a moment. Um, so first of all, you lose that connection to the land. And we make an assumption. I personally agree with this assumption, but nevertheless, it's an assumption um, that we we're disconnected from the land. We don't feel that sense of, of wholesome connectedness to the life cycle and so forth and the fresh air and the bucolic towns and so forth. And instead, we're shoved in these tiny little apartments and then shoved into these overcrowded, loud, noisy, stinky factories working and working and working. Um, sure, we're making more money. But we're disconnected from the land and disconnected from that life that is considered so healthful to us. OK, but now that's fine. But it's the last part that really gets me excited where they say and of the incitement to thrift that comes from the possibility of rising. Oh, uh, OK. Incitement means motivation, the, the desire, the, the motivation of thrift, meaning be efficient. Save your money, 
be efficient, do things well, and do them um, in the most cost-effective way possible. And as a result, you will grow in your farm or your business. Now, check this out. Check this out. Check this out. This is now very, very, very current and modern. Okay. Um, a lot of you probably want to start your own business one day. All right. Or maybe you already have your own business. Kiana, you have your own business. Kiara. Uh, Kiana. Sorry. Um, now, the nice thing about having your own business is you get the benefit or the cost of your own decisions, okay? So you make the decisions. You make the purchasing decisions. You allocate the resources. You decide how best to allocate your time, money, and energy so that you can get the maximum return for the investment of your time, money, and energy. And this is all up to you. You are autonomous. It's up to you. And that's what these folks on the farm are experiencing. They get to enjoy owning their lives and making decisions and progressing in their lives because of their decisions. On the other hand, if you're in a factory, heck, I'm not even going to say factory. Your job right now, I want you to think about your job right now. If you figure out how to do something more efficiently so that it costs less money or takes less time, who benefits? Not you. Not you. Your employer. Your employer. If you figure out how to produce more output for less input, you still have to put in the input and all that output goes to the employer. So you're not really incentivized to figure out how to be more efficient, how to be more innovative, how to produce more output for less input, because you're not going to benefit from it. And that is what's happening here. OK, Kiana, sometimes even Amazon can scam you, though. Um, it put, took a big loss, you know, on a product. Yeah. Yeah, you and and that's the thing is that it's it's if it goes great and fantastic you get the benefit and if it goes south it costs you it hurts oh trust me i know it hurts okay so if we continue on so that begs a question now that we have all this going we've essentially got a ruling class, which is the factory owners, because somebody needs to own that factory, and a working class, the serving class, the employees. For the first time, we've got this really, really ugly dynamic of those in power with capital and those who are subservient with no resources. And the only thing they can sell is their labor. So how do we make this work? Now, before we figure out how to make this work, we're going to have our next juggling lesson. So let's get that started. Okay. The last time we did juggling, so get your juggling balls if you have juggling balls. And if not, just get up and move around a little bit. I know we had a dance break, but it never hurts to do that. Okay, so last time we met, we did the double toss, right? So one, two, and one, two. Nice, simple, easy one, two. Now you probably noticed, and and if you're learning to juggle with me, you probably noticed that, oh, maybe my toss is not as good as I thought it would be. Um, so, you know, you go back and you practice that a little bit. But eventually you get to where this two toss is pretty natural. OK, going back and forth from the left hand to the right hand starting. 
Okay. So that's two balls. Now we got this third. Now, here's something I want you to think about. You're already juggling three balls. You're already juggling three balls. You just don't realize that two is the same as three. Okay? So what do I mean? Well, in every case, you are throwing and catching a ball. Okay? So think about this left hand. This left hand is about to throw and catch. Throw and catch. Right? In every case, you're throwing and catching a ball. Well, instead of just doing it on one side, you're doing it on both. I am about, I will show you, I am going to juggle three balls with two. You're just going to see an invisible ball. Okay? I'm juggling three, but one is invisible. So, instead of invisible, we have this. Okay. So, now, we're not just going to go right into juggling three, all right? We're going to start. We're going to start small. The first thing I want you to do is throw the three, one, two, three, and hear them hit the ground, one, two, three, all right? Uh, so it's just going to be nice and simple. Now, I'm not going to have them hit the ground because I have a stool in the way, but you want to hear the thump, thump, thump as they hit the ground. You want to hear... All right, one, two, three. You're going to start with two balls in your right hand and just do the three. Then you're going to start with two balls in your left hand and just hear that one, two, three as they hit the ground. Now, what you're going to find is a couple of things. One is you're going to freak out. You're going to see these three balls and two hands, and you're going to freak out, and you're going to try to throw them all at once. You don't. Don't throw them all at once. If anything, slow down. Just, you know, yeah, I guess I will drop them. Slow down and just let them hit one, two, three. Throw them one, two, three. Don't worry about catching. Just let them fall. What we just want are three nice arcs like we have before. One, two, three, going back and forth from the right hand to the left hand, okay? So that's the first thing you're going to notice. You're going to want to throw them all at once. Don't throw them all at once. The next thing you're going to notice, and I don't know why this is, it just happens. As you start to juggle, you're going to start moving forward you're going to start to kind of throw the balls out in front of you. So as you get to where you're doing three, you're going to be doing that a lot. Okay? It just, everybody does it. We start juggling, and for some reason, we're kind of tossing them out in front of us. And so we chase it, and the momentum makes the next ball go out in front of us even more. And before you know it, we're hurling balls across the driveway, right? So... When you start going, just really focus on keeping everything in the box, all right? But all I want you guys to do now is just do that one, two, three toss, right? So if I just, just let them fall, one, two, three, and go back and forth, back and forth from the right hand to the left hand. And then next week, we'll talk about actually catching. But just get nice, three nice arches. All right? Three nice tosses. And that, and then next time, we'll actually talk about catching and getting the numbers going and things like that. Okay. So, let's get back to work. Let's see what we're talking about on how we're going to treat folks. So, as I mentioned, um, we're creating two classes now. And you're in these classes, right? You're either a worker bee or you own the hive, right? So, we've got capital, which owns the factory and owns the equipment. And we have labor that shows up 
to run that equipment, okay? Um, now, you need both sides, but how those both sides take care of each other and so forth, this can get pretty tricky. Um, so remember from a previous lecture how Hellbrunner said, you know, those in power decided they owned the land, created enclosures and so forth, and, and basically created a lower class. Well, the reading calls this the naughtiest and most vexing of problems. Since the erection and operation of the factories demanded two things, money for building and maintenance and mill hands to operate the power looms, England soon found herself with two major classes of society, that representing capital and that re representing labor, the employer and the employed. Okay. Um, now, I got news for you. Labor, I mean, capital really makes all the rules. In case you didn't realize it, the companies make the rules. And we just sign the HR forms and say yes, because we do what we need to do to get the job. Um, now, this is what brought about trade unions, because remember, there were no regulations. Government was not involved. This was a laissez-faire. And so the unions came about because, well, nobody was looking out for them. All right. The, the, the labor was, was on its own. It didn't have the protections of government regulations about safety, work hours, pay, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? Um, so this is what started to bring about the union, unions, which we will talk about in greater depth in, in future lectures, all right? Um, but we're going to wrap things up today. I want to show you, um, we're going to end with two quotes about laissez-faire, um, one saying pro, the other saying negative. Um the man who accepts the laissez-faire doctrine would allow his garden to grow wild so that roses might fight it out with the weeds and the fittest might survive. That's laissez-faire. By the way, my garden does not follow laissez-faire. I control it with draconian practices, okay? The other quote, though, says... If one rejects laissez-faire on account of man's fallibility and moral weakness, one must, for the same reason, also reject every kind of government action. Meaning, what makes you think that any government regulation would be better? Just because you don't like what's happening now, what makes you think a government regulation would improve it? Because people are messed up, right? So. That is that. That's everything that we have to discuss for this um, uh, for this module. Um, boy, we've had more comments than that and so forth. So we're going to throw in another there just to make sure that you're taken care of because we've had good discussion. Um, as always... Um, I am going to stick around. If you have any questions, email me. I'm going to write this down. Email here. And let me know that you're here. And that way I can make sure that you get the extra credit. Kiana, you bet. I'm glad you like the dance party. Oh, it's a good way to get moving. Owen, thank you very much. And yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead and let me know. Or if we need to set up a Zoom, we can do that. Otherwise, you should be well set for this week, especially since I took the discussion out of the picture. The nice thing about getting older is you care less and less about being weird and cringy. So the dance party is good. 
And if you have any, you know what I ought to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to invite students to send me video footage of them dancing, and I'll put that in the uh, in the loop there. See if anybody takes me up on it. Who knows? If there's anybody out there that would like to join me in my weirdness. So I'll, I'll follow up on that. Sam, thank you very much. Mac, we'll see ya. Anna, everyone, Vanessa, thank you. Appreciate it. We'll see you, Isaiah. All right. Well, I see folks dropping off, so I'm going to go ahead and close things out and uh, tell you what, until we talk again, have a fantastic day.